So hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. I'm your host, Carney McRae, with the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. So now um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Greg Skolmal, by thanking first Wes Pratt, another shark researcher who is married to the Friends Board Treasurer, Theo Pratt, who connected us to Greg when we were looking for someone to help us answer why white sharks are appearing more frequently in the Gulf of Maine. So I love the way these connections work, and I'd like to now welcome Dr. Greg Skolmal uh, talking about living with white sharks. Well, thank, thank you, Carney. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to my, my friends, Wes and Theo. Um, Wes is actually a mentor of mine, uh, going back many years, and uh, one of the first uh, shark researcher I ever worked for and with, and, uh, and he taught me quite a bit. And his name's going to come up a few times tonight because um, he's done a lot of shark research over the last uh, several decades. Um, and although he uh, has been doing it for probably 50 plus years, he still looks about 27 years old. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully it all works like it has been over the last year. All right, I'm uh, assuming everybody can see that. And, and, and tonight I'm gonna to talk about the presence of white sharks in New England, but I'm going to really focus on Massachusetts. And the reason I'm focusing on on Massachusetts is because we have very little research that has been done on white sharks north of Massachusetts. And so I'm kind of giving you a sense of how we go about studying this species using a variety of technologies. Um, and I think that this same technology can be applied to the Gulf of Maine. I will give you some historical records from the Gulf of Maine to give you a sense of what's changing in the Gulf of Maine. Um, but I want you to learn about this species through the eyes of, uh, of what we've done off of Massachusetts and think of how it might be applicable to, to the coast of Maine. Um, we've been doing white shark research for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, it involves a, a number of different individual studies ranging from movement ecology um, to population size and abundance, relative abundance and how that's changing um, to a number of collaborative efforts we're doing with, with regional researchers uh, from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution to the New England Aquarium, University of Florida. So we've got a number of studies going on. Today, I am going to focus on movement ecology and, and what it means at fine scales. But it will take a, we'll, take, we'll, take, we'll start by taking a big picture look at what we know historically about the white shark off the Eastern seaboard of the United States. And uh, at the expense of referencing my good friend Wes again, this really goes back to a paper that he published with uh, Jack Casey, who were he, one of his, one of our collaborators um, back in 1985. And what Wes and Jack did was they compiled all the information that was out there relative to the distribution of the white shark in the Western and North Atlantic. And what you can see, and these are historical records going back to the year 1800. Um, there's over 600 records here, and they were updated by a student of mine, Toby Curtis, in a paper that we published in 2014. And what I want you to see is that the, it's distributed roughly from the eastern Gulf of Mexico, all along the eastern seaboard, way up into the Gulf of Maine, uh, including as far north as Newfoundland. And so the white shark historically has been present in these northern latitudes. Um, and, and so there has been a... Um, a lot of discussion, particularly in the last year, uh, or should I say like nine months, um, about what's changing in the Gulf of Maine and whether climate change might be driving the presence of these animals. I happen to think that it's actually the growing body of seals that is driving the presence of these animals. Um, a paper was published in 1998, and, and if you read this abstract, um, he basically states that, um, you know, the based on the information he's compiled off the Gulf of the coast of Maine, that the, uh, the white shark has been and is a perennial seasonal visitor to North, Northern Gulf of Maine. So it's something that it's a species that has occurred here um, historically. And it's also a species like the seals, which they hunt, 
that was also knocked down in terms of population size. And so if there's not a lot of seals, not a lot of white sharks, there's not a lot of chance you're going to see them. Both of those aspects are changing uh, over the course of the last two decades. Um, some of those green, so all those little green dots that you see in this are largely uh, fisheries interactions. And all that means, is most of these reports are reported by fishermen having captured these sharks. And, uh, and much of what we know about the white shark for many, many years in the Western North Atlantic came from those sharks being brought to the dock and guys like Wes Pratt and later me um, dissecting them, doing necropsies on them. So this is a really small, young of the year uh, white shark that was uh, shipped to our lab when I was working there with Wes. This is a, a colleague of ours, the late Chuck Stilwell. Here's a great photo that Wes Pratt took uh, of an adult male white shark. And so when we do necropsies on white sharks, they tell us a lot uh, about various aspects of their natural history, whether it be you know the obvious aspects being looking in the stomach and seeing what they eat, or perhaps uh, not so obvious, taking a section of their backbone and counting rings in the backbone to get an estimate of their age. Um, but none of these techniques really tell you much about their migration patterns, their movements, and their natural ecology. And for, for, for decades and decades, we knew very little to nothing about that until a paper published in 1982 by Frank Carey with my colleague, Wes Pratt, um, was a landmark paper, probably the first paper to ever be published on the movements of the white shark. And it was done right off the coast of Long Island. These guys went out there and tagged a white shark that was um, feeding on a whale carcass back in 1979. And uh, the tags that, that uh, Frank had developed, he built in his own laboratory. And he followed this shark for two and a half, three, day, three and a half days. And, uh, and what you see here is the track of that shark basically from one end of Long Island to the other um, with the shark remaining largely in, in offshore waters. So this is just a three and a half day snapshot into the natural history, the movements of this animal, this species. And it's the first time in the world anyone had ever done it. What I want you to really look at is this lower graphic. And this is the vertical behavior. So this is the diving behavior of the white shark over the course of those three and a half days. And what you can see with this line is that the shark for the most part remained in the upper part of the water column, largely associated with the thermocline, which is when you, that part of the, the water column where you get a, a dramatic temperature change, but occasionally made these trips to the bottom. And what Frank and Wes and their colleagues hypothesized is that White sharks were making these trips to the bottom because they might have been hunting for whale carcasses or potentially feeding on other kinds of creatures that are associated with the bottom on the continental shelf. And they also took it a little bit further and said, you know, the, the white sharks are behaving like this in the Atlantic because seal populations had been diminished to such low levels that it was no longer energetically profitable for them to go out and find and hunt seals. And indeed, you know, in 1979, when this was done, 1982, when it was published, seal populations were still uh, quite low. In 1975, the U.S. passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, because populations were so low. And now after almost 50 years of protection, we've seen seal populations respond to the highest level of protection that could be afforded to them. And as a result, they're now uh, coming back to mainland northeastern United States in big numbers. And so this is what the shoreline of, of Cape Cod looks like right now. And many of you, all of you who live in the, um, along the coast of Maine, you know very well that you can't go out there without seeing seals. Um, in the case of Cape Cod, the primary seal we see in the summertime when the white sharks are there is the gray seal. Um, as we get into the Gulf of Maine in your neck of the woods, we not only see the gray seal, we see the harbor seal, and we see a couple of other species, all of which are coming back and recolonizing parts of the U.S. and rebounding from very, very high levels of exploitation. So seals, which were driven to the brink of extinction literally 100 plus years ago, uh, have now come back in numbers. And they, what they represent 
is a very viable food resource for a top predator called the great white shark. Um, and so this is a photograph taken by Wayne Davis, who's this pilot that we use to find white sharks, of white sharks hunting very, very close to shore. And as you can imagine, uh, and this is shot right off Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and as you can imagine, this is also the very same areas where people like to recreate. And so what's happened over the course of the last decade as seals have responded and white sharks have responded to their presence and we get this unfolding of a very natural predator prey relationship, we now have that overlapping with human activities. And, and, and therefore, um, we have had negative interactions with white sharks. Historically, the last fatal shark attack in Massachusetts prior to 2018 was in 1936, when a young man was swimming off the coast of Buzzards Bay, of, of Mattapoisett in Buzzards Bay, and was struck by and killed by a white shark. Um, that was many, many years ago. That occurred uh, not too far from where I live. I live in the next town over from Mattapoisett, right here in Buzzards Bay. But since then, you know, in recent years, we had a swimmer attacked in 2012 off the coast of Truro while he was swimming. We had a kayakers whose kayak was struck aggressively in 2014 by a white shark. We had a paddleboarder who had his paddleboard struck aggressively in 2017. We had a swimmer bitten in 2018. And we had a, a bodyboarder who was bitten and killed in 2018. And of course, we all know what happened off Harpswell, Maine in July of 2020 um, with the fatal attack on a swimmer. And so we're seeing on a relative scale, and everything's relative here, we're seeing an increase in these interactions between white sharks and people. Um, because of the overlap, again, between this predator-prey relationship and human activities. And, um, and I must admit, like all of you, we were struck, uh, we were blindsided by the event that occurred off the coast of Maine because we haven't done much research off the coast of Maine relative to this species. But as you know, historically from the previous slides, the shark does go into those areas. Um, our research is kind of dramatically focused, uh, shifted in focus in 2019. And for the next five years, we've been intensively looking at uh, trying to answer a, a fairly simple question, seemingly simple question as to where, when, and how white sharks feed on seals. Um, we think that by better understanding, collecting data, observations of behavior directly and indirectly to look for patterns that might be associated with the environment, whether it be the, a certain depth, a time of day, a water temperature, a tide, a current, if, they, if we can observe this behavior, when are white sharks most likely to feed on seals? We think that, and we can establish that quantitatively and statistically, we can then forecast those areas where these kinds of events might happen. We think that when a white shark strikes a person, it's making a mistake. It's, an, it's in a predatory um, mode where it's attempting to feed on a seal. It's interpreting the person or the person's behavior as mimicking a seal, and then it attacks and makes a mistake. It's extremely rare, even though I've just pointed out several incidents that occurred since 2012, it is exceedingly rare. Um, but if we can find patterns in this behavior, we think we can augment and enhance public safety by sharing that information with the general public. So that's exactly what we're doing right now off the coast of Massachusetts. And we're expanding that work, and I'll go into this a little in greater detail as we get through this, into the Gulf of Maine, working with collaborators in the Gulf of Maine and the state of Maine. Um, and so what are we doing? We're using a variety of technologies that'll give us a glimpse into the behavior of this animal. And what we're really interested in is not so much what it does from week to week or, or, or even season to season anymore, we're interested in what it's doing from hour to hour or minute to minute and even second to second. That's the scale. That's the resolution that we're working at now. 
And so what we're doing is applying a variety of tags and the technique we use is somewhat unique. We have a spotter pilot that is Wayne Davis that you see here, in this photograph, and he points out white sharks to us. And then we go up to them while they're free swimming and we place a tag at the base of their dorsal fin using a standard intramuscular dart, a technique that's been used for decades um, while the animal's free swimming. So what we're trying to do is use the least invasive technique for tagging, such that we're not handling the animal, we're not hooking the animal, we're not trying to stress out the animal. And so I'll show you this technique and, and you'll see me on the end of this pulpit of the boat in this photograph here. And that's because by being on the end of the pulpit, which is a traditional technique for harpooning, right? By being on the end of the pulpit, I could sneak up on that animal with the animal not being spooked by the loud noise of the boat or the feeling of the boat. Um, and therefore, I, you know, place the tag accordingly. So here's a little video I'm gonna show you uh, of, a, of a tagging of a, a, about a 11 foot white shark right from the pulpit of the boat using this intramuscular dart, placing it right there at the base of the dorsal fin. And the shark just kinds of feels a little bit of a spook and then um, takes off. And I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll show you that again because it happens fairly quickly. But using this technique, we can apply a variety of tags. Um, and again, we do it without trying to harm the animal in any way. Last thing we want to do or any researcher wants to do when they tag an animal or manipulate an animal is you don't want to alter its behavior. If you alter its behavior, you know, you are um, not studying natural behavior. And ultimately, it's our goal to study natural behavior. And also, you don't want to alter the behavior of the animal in close proximity to swimming beaches, which is exactly where we are working. Um, so this is Cape Cod. as uh, Many of you know, this is Cape Cod and Cape Cod is uh, a peninsula where we have been working since 2009. And these are the three different technologies which I will talk about, uh, primarily talk about acoustic technology tonight. Um, but these are the three different kinds of tags that we have used on white sharks. Um, and we're expanding that repertoire into other kinds as well. Just so you know, um, on the right side, you see this graphic with all these uh, beautiful triangles. Those are all the places that we have seen white sharks, okay? And I will also tell you this, that we didn't start working in Cape Cod Bay until 2019. And that's when I, we identified these two areas as important habitat for white sharks. That's not to say that the white sharks don't also occur in other parts of Massachusetts. And I'm going to show you the technology that we're using to answer the question as to where are these sharks um, when we're not out there. So, you know, we're primarily working along the outer Cape. So when someone asks me along Cape Cod, where are the white sharks or where are not the white sharks, it's really hard pressed to find a, a space here along the outer Cape that these white sharks do not occur. Um, again, I'm going to focus on this, this acoustic tags, you, you know, Primarily, and uh, just to give, because that's the that's the technique that we're using to look at the really fine scale local movements. Um, what an acoustic tag does is it sends out a sound pulse, a ping, if you will, at 69 kilohertz, and that ping is coded individually to that in that particular shark. And so what we do is we place that just like I showed you in the previous video. Um, and then we set up an array of acoustic receivers. On the left side of the screen, you can see this acoustic receiver. It's actually only about 13, 14 inches long, maybe three inches in diameter. All right, we put out this array of receivers all around Massachusetts. And anytime the shark swims within the range of that array, um, which is generally about 500 meters, 500 yards, five football fields, that receiver will detect the shark and then log the information, the date, the time, when that shark was there, who is that shark. So by setting these receivers up, we can determine whether white sharks visit those areas and how frequently. And so as you can imagine, we have receivers off popular swimming beaches, we have receivers off popular seal haul outs, and we have receivers in bays and estuaries. We're just trying to get a sense of, on a relative scale, where these sharks spend their time around Massachusetts. It's...
So this is just a, a really neat graphic that shows you all our receivers around Cape Cod. Those are the yellow dots. And then you can see some simulated sharks with their acoustic tags on them pinging away. And, and again, anytime the receiver detects the shark, it will log that information. I have to go and collect those receivers to download the data, okay? So it does not transmit them in real time, even though that technology exists. And I'll talk about that in a second. And so this is what our acoustic receiver array looks like in Massachusetts and specifically in Cape Cod. We have them all the way from Boston, south along the South shore throughout the Gulf, the, I'm sorry, the Cape Cod Bay, in addition to along the outer Cape and even in parts of Nantucket Sound, Vineyard Sound and Buzzards Bay. Um, each one of these little white circles represents one of these acoustic receivers. In 2020, we tested uh, live receivers. Live receivers basically will transmit those detections instantaneously to lifeguards on the beach. So in essence, what is happening is Anytime the shark swims within the range of one of those starred receivers, um, that messaging will go to the lifeguards and they'll know that there's a white shark in, the, in, in that general vicinity. And so we've, we've placed those receivers at some of the more popular Cape Cod beaches. The reason we don't use all live receivers is because they cost about $15,000, okay? Um, the little acoustic receivers, the little white circles are roughly around $2,000. Um, and so there's a big price difference. And what we're trying to do is get as many receivers out there. Um, I'm gonna talk also tonight about the fine scale arrays. And so I'll, I'll, uh, and those have been placed up off of Truro as well as Orleans. And so as you look at this technology and we'll, I'll expand it into the Gulf of Maine shortly, you know, think about how it can be applied to the coast of Maine, to the Gulf of Maine, to the Bay of Fundy, and how it is being applied. And I'll show you how, what we're learning about the sharks we're tagging here. Now we've tagged over 200 white sharks with acoustic transmitters right now. And so those transmitters will last up to 10 years as long as they stay on the sharks. So we can follow the individual movements of these animals. and We can determine which ones hang around Cape Cod, which ones go into the Gulf of Maine, which ones go to Canada, and it's really quite amazing. Um, so let's answer some of your basic questions. When are the sharks here? Here being basically the Gulf, uh, the Northeastern US, Cape Cod, Gulf of Maine area. So all we have to do to answer this really simple question is plot the number of times our tagged white sharks have been detected each month. So for most of the year, um, basically from January through May, um, there are no white sharks here. And it's not until water temperatures begin to warm in June and uh, the sharks begin to show up and it really doesn't start to happen until July. Um, and then August, September, October are the peak months for white sharks, August, September, October. And of course that coincides with our most popular uh, months of the year relative to tourist activities and recreational activities. Um, when water temperatures begin to cool off in November, the sharks will leave, all right? So the sharks will take off as water temperatures, you know, as we start to get those, those northeast, northeasterly winds and the first couple of chills of the season, you know, we all start to put our coats on and October's over, the white sharks are also leaving, even though, as many of you know, the seals are here year round. So the sharks' movements are mediated by water temperature. And by mid-December, uh, all the sharks have left New England and Canada, and they are moving to parts south. And they'll overwinter off the southeastern United States as far as the Gulf of Mexico. So they will move down into warmer areas like snowbirds and then come right back up here again as water temperatures warm in, uh, in June and July. So we have the when. When are they here? Let's look at where they spend their time. And again, this will, this will focus on Cape Cod, but I'm gonna, gonna tell you a little bit about the Gulf of Maine as well. And so each one of these dots represents one of our acoustic receivers. Although when you look at the dots, they differ by size and the sizes of those dots are proportional to the number of sharks, 
of our tagged sharks that have been detected in those specific areas or on those specific receivers. And so, as you can see, not much happening as we move into the Boston area, but as we climb our way down the, the South shore, there's a handful of detections on these receivers. So if I'm managing beaches along the South shore of Massachusetts, I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's not a huge threat of white sharks because the number of white sharks is not very high. Um, as we work our way into, the, into Cape Cod Bay and particularly along the Eastern side of Cape Cod Bay, those dots, as you can see, begin to get larger and then really explode as we get in along the outer Cape. Um, so the outer Cape is the hot zone for the state of Massachusetts when it comes to the presence of white sharks feeding on seals and overlapping with human activities. And of course, we all know Cape Cod is a massive tourist attraction. And so um, when we look at these dots, we say to ourselves, why is that happening? And that's because of high densities of seals along the outer Cape. These are big, beautiful, long stretches of, of Cape Cod. And uh, there are a number of seal haulouts along the Cape and the seals are ever present in these areas and the white sharks are moving in to feed on these seals. So let's, let's combine the when and the where into a graphic, which you see here. Um, this is an animation. And so what I, want you to what, what I want you to see in this animation is the fact that um, as we progress through the year 2019, our white sharks uh, came into Massachusetts and then left. And what you see in the upper left-hand corner is June. Okay, so June, not many white sharks. And you'll see each of these white dots, which represents an acoustic receiver, begin to swell as the sharks move into our waters in 2019. So these are real data from 2019 of white sharks visiting Cape Cod and the rest of Massachusetts. And you'll see occasionally a, a big bubble of pier, and that's because a, a couple of sharks were hanging out on that particular receiver for a couple of days. Now we're into uh, August, and look at the size of those bubbles, uh, which have the greatest number of detections. Again, you'll see primarily along the outer Cape. Um, we're now into September. Presence of sharks is still quite high, very abundant. You see them move along the uh, eastern shoreline of Cape Cod Bay. We'll also see some sharks filter down from the Gulf of Maine because they've been up in the Gulf of Maine all summer. And then as we get into late November, the dots will shrink. And as we're into uh, December, they go away. So that, that is 2019 white sharks coming to Massachusetts. And so if I'm managing beaches along the outer Cape, I'm thinking, okay, I know the seasonality. I know where they're spending their time. Now I need to know, you know, specifically what areas are they likely to be hunting seals? Um, and so what I've thrown in here is a graphic of the Gulf of Maine. Um, what's really cool about ac the acoustic technology is that it is used by a number of researchers to study all kinds of species, whether it be Atlantic sturgeon or striped bass or codfish, um, poor beagle sharks, sand tigers, you name it. And so what you see here are acoustic receivers that were put in the Gulf of Maine by various researchers doing projects on other species, but they picked up our white sharks, okay? So the sharks that we're tagging off of Massachusetts, about 20% of them will move into the Gulf of Maine and they are detected by their existing receivers that are there. You can see there's also areas, this yellow dot, by the way, represents where the fatal attack occurred in 2020 but there are big broad stretches where you need receivers. And so working with the state of Maine, Arizona State University, the Atlantic Shark Institute, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, a number of uh, other groups, we're, we're providing receivers to the coastline of Maine and trying to fill in some of these blank areas to start getting a sense of what movements of white sharks look like along the, the Maine coast and in the Gulf of Maine and what hotspots might exist. I mentioned briefly these real-time receivers. These real-time receivers will transmit to lifeguards on the beach. Um, this is one of those $15,000 units deployed off of um, Newcomb Hollow Beach. There's a lifeguard stand right here. 
And anytime a white shark swims within 500 yards of that receiver, that lifeguard gets a notice that there's a tagged white shark in that area. And you say to yourself, wow, that's great, except we haven't tagged all the sharks. And you're absolutely right, we have not. Um, however, what it does do is it trains the lifeguards and beach managers on the sense of how frequently those sharks are there, how long they spend in the area, and perhaps gives them uh, aspects that they can look at would help them better manage their beaches relative to human activities. And uh, in talking to my, my colleagues at Maine um, EMR, I'm, I'm understanding that they may be purchasing one of these receivers to test it along the Maine coast. So let's get into the more difficult question to answer and how do they go about hunting these seals? And are there patterns of behavior that we can use and learn from and forecast where white sharks might be in areas that might pr prove to be dangerous to humans? Again, in the context that these are extremely rare events. Um, and the way we uh, study how they hunt seals, this happens on the order of seconds to minutes and can happen very, very quickly, is we go out there and we're observing. So we can get direct observations of hunting behavior, and we have. Over the course of the last decade, we've observed white sharks attack and kill seals, but not as frequently as you would think. So here's a white shark that it successfully attacked and attacked and killed a gray seal in shallow water adjacent to a Cape Cod beach. Um, here's some footage of a white shark feeding on a, on a seal. And uh, I think it's really amazing to watch this because seals are pre formidable predators themselves. And, and white sharks target the seals because they have the capacity from a, a physiological and morphological point of view, they're built as top predators, they're also targeting that rich blubber layer that these seals have that could sustain the shark for days to weeks. And so seals provide a really viable uh, boost of energy for the sharks that they can utilize or store, just like we would be attracted to say, you know, bacon. <laughs> White sharks love uh, to consume these animals. It is their job to control seal populations. And with White sharks responding, to um, the presence of these animals, we're seeing really the restoration of a natural ecosystem and one that probably hasn't existed off the Northeastern US for decades, if not hundreds of years. The other way we can observe white shark hunting behavior is using fixed station aerial cameras or drones. This is a balloon system that we have purchased and are using to set up and observe beaches uh, for the presence of sharks and watch them as they interact with seals and watch the behavior of seals as well. Again, direct observations. Another technique that we're using is these fine scale arrays that I mentioned. Um, remember these two red uh, boxes that I showed you in a graphic a few slides ago. Um, these are fine scale acoustic arrays. And all that we're doing there is putting these acoustic receivers so close together at these two beaches that we can triangulate the exact positions of the sharks and see how they move relative to the habitat. This is work we're doing with the Seventh Center for Coastal Studies. And um, what we're also doing with the center is mapping that habitat to watch as sharks move through and see how they behave in this habitat, how they react relative to sandbar systems, the currents, the turbidity, the tide, you name it, time of day. Um, and so this graphic shows the acoustic receivers nightly, uh, tightly bound up together at Head of the Meadow Beach in Truro, and as well as at Nauset Beach. You can imagine a shark moving through here, we can track its movements. And that's exactly what we did in 2019. Um, we were able to track the movements of 31 white sharks just over a three week period off the head of the meadow beach up in Truro. And these are the individual tracks of these animals as they moved through. Um, and now what we can do is compare those tracks and model those tracks relative to the, to the environmental conditions at, those, at that time. Um, and so this is a graphic that shows the movements of an individual white shark as it relates to the sandbars that developed off this beach. There's also a big haul out of seals in this area. 
Each one of the black dots represents an acoustic receiver. And the white shark there is that triangle that's swimming around and it's exact movements that it made close to shore. So you can see how this can give us an, a glimpse into the behavior of these animals as it relates to environmental conditions. Another way that we're using uh, to try to get indirect and direct to some extent observations is using behavior tags. And, and Wes is another great example of someone who's partnered with uh, researchers to use acceleration data logging tags. And he was actually one of the first to do it on nurse sharks in the dry tortugas um, years ago. And um, so I've partnered with the same fellow, Nick Whitney, to develop technology that we can put on white sharks that will give us a sense of how these animals are behavior, behaving, not only every minute, but every second, every second of the day. And so what you see this shark towing is one of these camera behavior tag systems. Here's another graphic of one of these systems. These have a built-in camera system in them, and they're also measuring the behavior of the animal in three-dimensional space. In other words, where is it in the water column? What's the water temperature? Is it accelerating? How is it accelerating in three dimensions? What direction is it going in in three dimensions? So we can actually look at the posture, the behavior, the individual behaviors of these animals every second of the day, hoping to tease out behavioral patterns that'll tell us when the shark is hunting, when it is resting, when it is just cruising. And so we've been deploying these tags now for two summers and, um, and getting some really remarkable information from them. And I'll, I'll show you uh, one of these sharks that we have one of these tags on. This particular shark was hunting extremely close to shore, targeting the, one of these three seals. Um, but the seals were too close. Um, it's very, very shallow water here, and big fish don't like shallow water. Um, but the shark nonetheless made an attempt at one of these seals. And this is a, a photograph shot by Wayne of the moment that this shark came in close to shore in an attempt to attack and kill a seal. It failed at the attempt, but we're able to get data from the tag and, and also footage from the tag. So we can look at how this animal was behaving during one of these predatory strikes. So now I'm gonna show you video captured by the, uh, the tag itself. And this shark is cruising right now, but what's gonna happen is it's going to accelerate. And when it accelerates, the camera is gonna go nuts um, because it's tethered. And when the camera goes nuts, you're not gonna see a heck of a lot except um, the camera flying all over the place. And that's the shark moving into shallow water in an attempt to attack and kill a seal. And it's in hot pursuit of that seal, but the seal is, a, believe it or not, a much better swimmer than the shark. And if the seal sees the shark, it can elude the shark very, very easily. There's the shark uh, taking off uh, in an attempt to get the seal. You can see the surface, you can see the bottom, and then it settles out. Um, and so we captured this not only on camera, but we captured it also in the data from the tag itself. Um, and if we look closely from the, at the video, we can actually see a moment where you see the seal, you know, move away from the shark as it's in hot pursuit. So these kinds of predatory events and the frequency with which they happen and where they happen and the environmental conditions surrounding when they happen will allow us to start to tease out those patterns we're looking for. Um, and here's data from the tag itself. And so here's you can see the tag goes on. And when the tag goes on the shark, the shark dives down to the bottom. All right, the bottom's about 15 meters deep. So this is the tagging event. What I want you to see in these three graphs, this is the shark accelerating in three dimensions, forward, sideways, and up. Okay, you can see bouts of acceleration that occur here. But later on, you can also see additional bouts of acceleration with the shark moving into shallow water. We think these are, again, predatory strikes. So we can look at the conditions under which these occur from an environmental perspective, as well as um, looking for those patterns that we can tease out. So this is how we can use acceleration data technology to really investigate the behavior of these animals. Um, Taking these data, then we can really recreate the movements of the shark. 
So here's the white shark again, moving into shallow water, going to the surface. The data stream is on the left. And we're gonna show you how we can use those data to completely rebuild the behavior of that animal and the conditions that precipitated this attack. If we do this enough and we observe it enough, we can figure out when, where, and how white sharks are attacking seals. Share that information with the public and with beach managers. Um, we're hoping to develop these relationships and model these relationships and ultimately produce, just like weather maps, forecast maps of areas of high probability. So here's just an example of a project we're working on where we look at the correlation between water temperature, white sharks, you see it's quite high at this temperature. We then look at satellite imagery, look for those temperatures, and then we map out those hot spots, which are the bright yellow, that we can share with the general public, give them a sense of those zones where white sharks might be more apt to be feeding that particular day. That's the ultimate goal. Have we gotten there yet? No, you need to stay tuned. Um, and as I said, we are expanding this work into the Gulf of Maine by forming the New England White Shark Research Consortium, where we partner not only with the state of Maine, Department of Marine Resources, but Rhode Island's DEM, as well as the state of New Hampshire. With these nonprofit organizations, the Conservancy, Shark Institute, the New England Aquarium, the Center for Coastal Studies, as well as UMass Amherst, School for Marine Science in Dartmouth, Arizona State University, and now the University of Maine, in addition to our, our colleagues at the National Marine Fisheries Service and DFO Canada. And so you didn't see a lot of data from the Gulf of Maine, but I promise you it's the direction we're going in. And, the, and I think we've set the stage of taking what we're doing here in Massachusetts using it as a template to figure out what's going on in your neck of the woods, you know, to identify those hot spots, those behaviors. I'd like to say that what happens here happens there, but I can't because the Gulf of Maine is a very different body of water and very different habitat than what we see off the coast of Cape Cod. And so it's going to be interesting to see how the behavior of the white shark, which is an incredibly adaptable species, shifts and changes relative to the habitat you've got in your neck of the woods. And so with that, I'm gonna thank a whole bunch of people that have funded my research over the years. It is a team that I work with. Um, and I will also, I think I have ample time, thankfully, um, to, to answer questions that you folks might have. Um, if, you, uh, if you like books about sharks, I wrote one called The Shark Handbook. And there's another one that's a really great kid's book called The Great White Shark Scientist written by Cy Montgomery. Uh, both books are available through the, the standard outlets, online outlets. Um, and so Carney, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I will um, gladly entertain questions. Okay, why don't you um, remove your share screen so we can see you um, better. And I'm gonna check in the chat, chat box. I did see something come in. Um, so um, the first question that came in is, will a shark beach itself hunting seal? <laughs> oh, I love that one. Um, yes. Yes, it absolutely will. And we've, we've seen it. Um, you know, remember those necropsies? I, uh, I showed you those dead sharks. And we do necropsies on the, one that, on the ones that beach themselves. But in 2015 in particular, we had three or four white sharks beach themselves, um, in a, we think, in failed attempts to attack and kill seals. Um, and just last year, I saw one uh, slide up on a, a sandbar and struggle to get back off of it. And so, you know, it's a bit of a learning curve for these animals. They certainly are hardwired to find seals, but I believe there's a learning curve when it comes to figuring out how to go about hunting one and killing it and eating it in uh, challenging environmental conditions uh, like we have off Cape Cod. You know, high turbidity, shallow water, um, heavy currents, big surf, all that. And, uh, I, I think it's a bit of a challenge. Okay, thanks. And someone else who says they're an open water swimmer far up in Penobscot Bay, but near two resident seal groups. Should I still be doing this? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I did emphasize shark attack to some extent. And, I, and, and as Wes knows, we, sci, shark scientists tend not to do that. But because our 
research is so focused on trying to prevent it. Um, I did focus on it today. Just realize that the probability of one of these events happening is, is extremely low, all right? So people ask me all the time, I'm gonna go to the beach, I'm gonna go swimming, what should I do? And I always say, drive safely because you're more likely to be killed in your car um, on the way to the beach. That being said, if you're concerned about white sharks, um, then, you know, depth is critical. Um, you're an open ocean swimmer, so you're probably swimming in deep water. If there's high densities of seals in the area, one of the things we've learned, and you've learned tonight, is when there's high densities of seals, white sharks will uh, go to those areas. Um, so as I said, I don't know enough about the Gulf of Maine to predict where these animals are going to show up, but um, we'll expand our work into that area, working with these other partners, hopefully have a better answer to that question. But if you're nervous about it, I would say restrict your activities to shallow water. Okay. And here's a question. What is it that draws the sharks to the seals? Smell? Sound? Memory? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's smell. Um, you know, they, they have to find the seals, right? And so you know, they have a, this really amazing suite of senses, sharks do, and, and each one is useful at a di varying distances. And, you know, and I think that smell is a key, key sense that draws the sharks uh, at least in the general ballpark of where these seals are. Uh, sound may play a role, sight absolutely, when the sharks are close enough, but there's a whole lot of hunting going on in this shallow water. And, and I've, had, I've had scientists say to me, hey, or divers or filmmakers say, hey, I wanna go dive in with these sharks without a cage. And I always say to them, these are animals that are hunting in shallow water, I would not do that. Um, we may not smell like a seal, but we might look like one. and so. Um, I think smell is, is important from great distance. Mm, okay. And do you think the breach that occurred with you on the boat pulpit was predatory in nature or an agitated behavior? I thought a lot about that. Um, you know, the whole event was a split second and I, I, I was in disbelief when it happened till everyone till showed me the video <laughs> and, um, and the shark was coming up, you know, at first I thought maybe we startled the shark. It was very turbid water. We couldn't see much. I never saw the shark coming until it was out of the water. Um, but the fact that the shark's mouth was open, um, it may have been a defensive posture. It may have, uh, I thought it might've been a predatory strike at my image at the surface. Um, and so the shark was coming up as it would with a seal at the surface, mouth wide open and striking with its momentum coming out of the water. Um, and uh, below my feet, but uh, you know, I I thought I thought long and hard about it, and I don't know if there's a right answer to this. So I've got mixed emotions as to whether we startled it, whether it was defensive, or whether it was a predatory strike. Okay, uh, here's one. What do you think of Ocean Ramsey, the woman in Hawaii who swims with sharks? Yeah, I mean, Ocean Ramsey gets a bit of criticism from the scientific community, and and, and I, I might include myself with that. Um, you know, white sharks are incredibly unpredictable. Um, I think if you're in the, if you're not in a, an area where they're hunting, you know, I don't have a real problem. I know a few people who free dive, including Roshan Ramsey with white sharks. I don't know if the message is, is a good message to be, you know, holding on to the sharks. Um, you know, it is, it's an unpredictable species that feeds on large prey about our size. And so, you know, I think, that she, her messaging is 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 definitely pro shark and, and ocean conservation and shark conservation. I like that, um, but I I'm I'm not necessarily comfortable with some of the things she does in the water with them. Okay, um, what's the best thing to do if I'm swimming off Cape Cod and see a fin nearby? Um, I would calmly leave the water. Absolutely, calmly leave the water. Um, but one thing I will tell you is is white sharks are ambush predators. So, you know, it's not the shark you see necessarily that you should be too worried about. It's um, the one you don't. You know, they can only successfully attack and kill seals using speed and stealth, all right? So hunting in turbid water, you know, works to their advantage to some extent, um, but it's, it's all about speed and stealth. 
and so the shark you see, you know, once a shark is seen, it knows that it's not likely to successfully um, feed on, uh, uh, successfully kill it, uh, a seal. And so just calmly leave the water is what I would do. Okay. Um, do the many acoustic tags needed for this work create excessive noise pollution in the ecosystem? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, what we like about the tags is they're very high frequency. And so most fish, most and most uh, and sharks can't hear them. Um, however, marine mammals can. Um, and if there's high densities of marine mammals, like in the case of seals, it's possible they can pick up this sound. Um, realizing, of course, that it dissipates fairly quickly. And it's also pinging only once every minute to two minutes. Um, but you know, it is a tool that we use and certainly something we try to balance out the impacts on the ecosystem. I think I'm, I'm much more concerned with other sources, sources of noise than I am these tags. Okay. Um, this is more of a comment that you um, can talk about. Based on the shark's affinity for the outer beaches of the Cape, I imagine that sharks moving up estuaries, rivers in search of seals is less likely and therefore more inland coves are probably safer. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, yeah, absolutely. It all depends on access to those coves and and seals and quantity of seals, you know. And so, um, you know, if you have a major haul out at the mouth of a river system and it's deep water nearby, you know, absolutely there could be a white shark hunting in those areas. But if it shoals up and it's a narrow, you know, inlet, not likely to, to be a white shark challenging itself in those areas. Okay. Are the white sharks here the same as the great whites near the far Farallons on the west coast? It, it's the exact same species. There are some uh, subtle uh, molecular differences in, genetically, but um, it is the same species. But there's no interchange between the two oceans. Okay. And if there are white sharks around, is it likely that there are other types of sharks in the area as well? Well, you know, not likely, no. Um, white sharks are a dominant animal. And, and some of our data, which I didn't show you tonight because of the time constraints, um, I didn't show you a lot of data, but um, shows that individual white sharks seem to set up uh, territories in certain areas. In other words, they hang out in one particular spot all summer, which would be indicative of territories, which means they would displace uh, other sharks, other white sharks, and, and, and other, and, and other species of sharks, which are for the most part, with the exception of the basking shark, smaller, are likely to be prey of the white shark. Um, the basking shark would not be. Um, so we do see overlap between those two species. But uh, if you're seeing white sharks, you're not likely to see the others in tight to shore. And when you say shallow water, what does that mean? Well, along the outer Cape, when I tell folks, um, you know, if that are concerned about the presence of these animals, I will tell them not to go in over their waist, quite honestly. Um, we have seen white sharks in water as shallow as six feet. Mm, okay. Couple of um, questions about wetsuits. Does the color of the wetsuit affect the shark's behavior and is no wetsuit safer than a wetsuit? Yeah, good, Great questions, and I wish we had solid answers. There have been a number of companies and researchers testing a variety of suit types, um, colors. Um, I know Wes used to wear a wetsuit that matched the ocean perfectly um, when we were diving with blue sharks together. Um, yeah, th there's some who believe that black stripes on a wetsuit will deter sharks. Just unfortunately, there's not a lot of empirical data to support these things because those are really difficult studies to do. You know, you're, you're going to have trouble getting volunteers for those kinds of studies. And so what you have to do is try to lure the shark. And by luring the shark, you've already modified its behavior. And so um, I wish I had a, be a better answer for that, but it doesn't exist. OK, um, do you do we know where the white sharks off the Cape are going during the winter? Yeah, for the most part, they overwinter off the southeastern U.S. and Mexico. I was just in South Carolina last week, and I tagged three white sharks. Um, so they're from South Carolina all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. Some of the white sharks, though, we found it, an interesting pattern. They move out into the open Atlantic. So they leave the coastline. They move out into the open Atlantic as far east as the Azores. 
And when they're out in the open Atlantic, they'll dive to depths as great as 3,000 feet. So there's this oceanic phase of white sharks in the Atlantic that we didn't know about that is uh, intriguing because we don't know why they do it. Hmm. Okay, um, have you witnessed interactions between sharks such as defending territory or breeding or even some form of social behavior? We, we haven't observed a lot of social behavior and we really want to because we know it happens. We, we think it's far, for the most part negative. We've never seen baiting behavior, which of course would be positive, even though it, I suspect it's quite violent. Um, but, you know, we do find scars on both males and females, juveniles and adults. So we know they interact with each other. Some of those scars are from seals, but many of those scars are from other sharks. Uh, but we we very rarely, if ever, have seen that behavior. We've just seen evidence of it. Okay. And um, do you know if there's a greater incidence of bull shark attacks in this area than white shark attacks on humans? Well, the bull shark has been implicated in the second greatest number of unprovoked attacks on humans, according to the International Shark Attack file. Um, but the bull shark is not known to occur uh, well, I must say there was an incidence, there was an occurrence of a bull shark off Long Island, but to have them this far north is unusual. That's not to say that might, that could happen because as you folks know, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than almost any other body of water on earth. And we are seeing the uh, shifts in the distribution of uh, other species of sharks into these areas, black tips, spinners, possibly even bull sharks. So up until now, we've had no fatal, no attacks by bull sharks because we didn't have bull sharks here. That could change. Great. So I've got two more questions and then we'll be ending the evening. Um, what causes a strike on a kayak, the shape? Good idea, great, great question, great question. You know, the sharks are, you know, the, 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 most likely the shape and the silhouette of that at the surface. And that shark was in hunting mode and uh and interpreted the kayak and literally bit the kayak with such force that it pierced the hull of the kayak the fiberglass hull of the kayak and sank it um the women ended up in the water and unfortunately fortunately they were not they were not hurt but we assume it was the silhouette of the kayak so the final question for you is um we have a person that's curious about what's in your terrarium in the back, the aquarium. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a freshwater. It's my my kids' freshwater aquarium, and we've got some mollies and some guppies. We're breeding the guppies. Yeah, I like to have fish around me uh, all the time. So, yeah, <laughs> great question. Great question. So I think that wraps it up. We certainly, if you think of other questions, you can um, email me at info at mainecoastislands.org and I'll um, send questions to Greg and he assures me that he'll answer them for you.